Last time we left, Mac had run off into the Crimson Forest in order to tell his mother of the Blooming Flower. But that forest has been condemned by Queen Ming. We have to go out and... Oh, come on. We have to go out and make sure that he is okay. One gold. I feel kind of bad for that. So... Everyone's at full HP, and you'll notice we have Cook on our team. Cook, of course, is Kaim's newly discovered grandmother. Or grandmother, granddaughter. <laughs> yep. And interestingly is Mac's sister. So she wasn't able to stop him from going off into the forest. Let's look at some skill links. Because right now, we have everything Jansen has to offer. Now Cook has level 1, white magic level 2, white magic. But also, Angel Heart boosts the amount of HP restored by healing magic. It's okay. Reduces the spell casting time of the user. That's actually pretty excellent. And reduces the spell casting time for one party member. Now that... can be very useful because Jansen will often be held up in his casting. Let's see, anything else in here to search before we go off to the Crimson Forest? You may have seen a sparkling, but that was from a book we read a couple episodes ago. The Crimson Forest is in the mountains to the west. We'd better hurry. There are monsters showing up outside of town. Okay, we don't have any more seeds. That's all right. And so we will be hurrying on down to rescue Mac. Now, Mac is a pretty tough cookie. I didn't realize what I said there until I just said it, but I stand by it. And he certainly acts a bit weaker. But... When he screams, the world shakes. And so we have a thousand dream right off the bat. Now if you've been following along, you know that I'll leave a timestamp in the description. Go ahead and click on that if you want to skip it. Otherwise, let's join us for this ride. A dream has been revealed. Evening. Bell. Rolling farmland spread out before him, Kaim harvests vegetables, wielding his hoe with deep concentration. The sky on this autumn evening is a deep crimson. Maybe we should call it a day, says a heavy set woman who owns the farm. She drops an armload of vegetables into the basket. Kaim nods and wipes the sweat from his brow. You're a tremendous help, says the woman. Look how much you've done! Kaim responds to her praise with a slight nod. You still can't remember where you come from? she asks. Afraid not. Well, the way you work, she says with an easy laugh, I don't care if you come from the moon! Seriously, Kaim, what will you do when the harvest ends? I don't know yet. I haven't made up my mind. There's plenty of work to do here in the winter, she says. It'll be fine with me if you wanted to stay on a while longer. Thank you, says Kai. She herself is a hard worker and a warm human being. This is not a life that allows for luxuries. But going out to the fields at dawn every day and ending work as the sun goes down softens the heart, even as it toughens the body. As they prepare to leave the field, a small bell begins to ring. The hour is still somewhat early for the church's evening bell. Kaim glances down to the road at the base of the hill. 
The funeral procession advances slowly along the road. The mourners surrounding the coffin, or the mourners surrounding a horse cart being bearing a coffin. The woman sits her hoe on the ground, removes her headscarf, and clasps her hands together. Kayim scans the hills and to find that all the other workers on the surrounding farms are doing the same thing, clasping their hands, bowing their heads, and closing their eyes in the direction of the passing funeral. Kayim follows their example. The old man leading the funeral procession swings the little bell. Its ringing echoes among the hills. The mourners pass in silence. The women in black veils, the men in black coats, head bowed. The children in the rear elbow each other playfully, unaware of the meaning of death. When the funeral has passed, the woman raises her head and blinks her moistened eyes. The one who passed away is going home, she says. Home? Kaim asks, somewhat startled. Home. To the soil. To the sky. To the sea. Like all living things. Kaim nods in silent recognition. How many deaths has he seen in this endlessly long life of his? All those people leave this world of ours, and we never see them again. In that sense, death is an infinitely sad event. If, however, we think that in dying, they go back to their homes somewhere, a certain comfort and even joy comes to mingle with the sadness. But Kaim, who can never grow old or die, can never go home. The woman scoops up a handful of earth and says with deep feeling, Many lives have become a part of this soil. The lives of tiny living things we can't see. The lives of withered grass. If you think about it that way, our vegetables are made for us by the lives of many others. I see. Can I ask you a favor, Kaim? Of course. If I should die while you're working here, would you scatter some of my ashes on this field for me? A handful would do. Kaim is at a loss for words. He forces a smile. Husband dead, children on their own, the woman lives by herself on the farm. Kaim knows that if he goes on working here, like it or not, he will eventually have to watch over the woman's deathbed, even if she were to die 100, 200 years from now. The church bell rings, signaling the death, signaling the end of the workday. The woman clasps her hand as before her as she did when the funeral passed. I have been allowed to come safely through one more day. For this I give my heartfelt thanks. May tomorrow be another healthy day for me. Her voice and prayer resounds forcefully in Kaim's breath. Breast. I cannot talk tonight. This happens every time he hears the church's evening bell. The conviction overtakes him that he does not belong here. Ma'am? He says to the woman, after the last chime resounds. Yes? Wouldn't you say that people give thanks for each safe day and pray for good fortune in the day to come because they know their lives will end? What? What's wrong, Kaim? I'll be leaving the village when this harvest is over. Why all of a sudden? What's happened? I have no right to live here, he says. Ignoring her stupef stupefaction, Kaim lifts the vegetable basket in both arms. He takes another good, long look at the setting sun. Where will you go, Kaim, if you leave here? I don't know. Somewhere. Are you just going to keep wandering like this? I don't have any place to go home to, says Kaim. Hoisting the basket onto his shoulder, he starts down the hill. His back grows red in the setting sun. End. Well, that was a short one, wasn't it? That's okay. I could use a short one tonight. And yes, yes, this voice is still here. But it's slowly, ever so slowly, changing back. So we are at the port of Namara. Let's just take a look. Anyone see Mac?
Damn, they must be planning to invade Ura. I think they are. I think Mac is going to take priority. Crimson Forest, here we come. Isn't it just the color of autumn leaves? Although, it is incredibly intense. The reason the Queen forbade entry was because the Crimson Forest is cursed, stained with blood. It's also called the Forest of Sorrow. What? Blood? Now, don't be a wimp. <laughs> it was 500 years ago, wasn't it? Huh? years ago, a country to the east invaded Numara. This forest is now crimson, the color of the blood from those who fell in that battle. You read the story of that. Who knows how many thousands of forgotten soldiers lie beneath the soil, staining this forest red for eternity. Okay, let's just make sure everyone have only things that they can use. Oh. You're gonna be our white mage. MP when defend is used. It's useful. Alright. And I'm going to go ahead and use another slot seed on both of them. So we started with, what was it, three? We used one and then another five. So I don't have enough if we get Sarah on our team, it just sounds like she's going to be an Eternal or Immortal to give one to everybody. Let's take a look though. Hmm. Alright, you have factual analysis, we don't need that. Status analysis. Nobody has status analysis. Oh, she has status analysis, so you don't need it. Recovers HP when defend is used. 
I'll take it. And I guess she'll take treasure. Seems like a great time to save, don't you think? Let's go off in this direction, see what we can find. Angel's plume. Maybe, maybe knocking over totems isn't the best thing we can be doing. But who knows? Fragile. Okay. But I apparently not. So it's the pink ones that we can take care of. Let's just take a quick look at our crystal fragments. Rare crystal. Alright. Wondering when we're gonna get into a battle. Are you some kind of beast? <laughs> oh wow. Looks like if I can hit first, I'll be okay. Perfect. I mean, it's perfect. That was close. So some kilo oil or kilo if it's cool on whetstone and cook learned prayer. So concentrate or whatever I used took her out of the battle for quite a bit. 
Ah, nothing's happening. Looks like something made by the Eastern Tribe. I guess it wouldn't respond to us since we don't know any spirit magic. Okay. Let's go here. I suppose that won't respond either. Oh, and we saw that outside of Gengora's uh, mansion. Empty paralysis herb. This does not look good! Take a look at you. No type, but your water element. Now fire is good against wind, wind is good against earth, earth is good against water, and water is good against fire. If I remember correctly, it's been a bit. You are water? Yes. It is late. But that's okay. Give me a Hercular, Hercular ring. Once again, we're on Cure Poison duty. Oh, you have to love Cook's animation. Paralysis. And you since you can get your MP back. Just... Get another crystal fragment. Kaim needs to learn something new. Hmm. 
gonna go ahead and give him the apprentice earrings. Battle. Don't let him get away. This is interesting. So they're fire type. Water power. Herculean. Bell. I'm thinking we may need to increase the magic defense of everyone. Perfect. That is some powerful element. What do I have for fire? Fire power drain. That looks promising. Bio killer. Water and MP absorb. We're gonna go ahead and stick it with that. Crimson forces. Really that was hard. very fun. All right, they've learned their casting support. Hmm. Her might be nice. We'll just go in separate directions for now. Yeah, one more, and then one for each of them. One more for that. I 
another crystal fragment. It's Max! I wonder if she slipped. You know that kid's not too bright after all. <laughs> Mac must be ahead of us. Let's go. I feel like now I need to go back. In fact, I'm almost certain of it. So we'll come back here. Just to keep exploring. Plus, the more experience we get, the better. Up we got a seed. Another crystal fragment, huh? This won't do anything because we don't have our spirit mage. Oh, and this has made it full circle. So there's our crystal fragment. So let's go ahead and save. I have a feeling that this is going to be a little bit tough. And so what I'm going to do... Go off camera for just a bit. Episode's not over, but we're going to do some leveling, so stick with me. Okay, as part of leveling up, I went back to Numaro to rest. I was able to complete the gondola quest. I was able to complete a couple of other things in there, including a music box quest where we just simply chose the notes C, E, G, C. And while crossing the bridge to go back to the Crimson Forest to continue leveling up, I have this scene. Yes, those are yours. Okay, so we have another dream that has been revealed. Portraitist of the Dead. As always, if you would like to skip this, please check the timestamp below and we'll provide it so that you can get on with the series. For those of you who enjoy the Thousand Years of Dreams, then join me as I read this. She always has morning clothes with her. That way she can get a portrait as soon as her quest comes in. And so it has today. Having slipped into her morning dress in the shed of the pier, she boards the downstream ferry. Her hands are full. One holds a case with her painting tools, and the other the garment bag for her morning dress. She has heard that a rich man lies dying in town, twenty kilometers downstream. Her name is Rosa. It's a race against time, she says with a grim smile. I have to start as soon as possible, before the face changes. Changes how? Pam asks. It's hard to say. There's a deepening, strange rosy smile. But I know when I see it, when the person has gone from this side to the other side. Once they've gone over, I can't paint them. At least not in a way that will please the family. It just can't be done. Rosa is a professional portraitist of the dead. The custom of preserving death masks is now widely practiced in this area. Families too poor to hire an artist daub the face with newly deceased with, of the newly deceased with dye and preserve the loved one's deathbed expression on a cloth pressed against the dyed face. Some families make a death mask with plaster. Only the wealthiest families can afford to hire a professional like Rosa. So that lurking in the background of an individual's death, there can be a variety of disputes. I've heard families quarreling over the inheritance behind my back, even as I sit there sketching the dead person. One widow presented my portrait of her husband to the court to prove that he had been poisoned. Another time, some loan sharks waited until the moment the man died and charged right into the house. One husband tried to spit in his wife's face as soon as she gave up the ghost. Apparently, she had been unfaithful to him for years. Rosa tells her stories with utter detachment. She reveals no emotion at all. This, she says, is indispensable to becoming an outstanding portraitist of the dead. 
You have to open your sketchbook and get your brushes going with the bereaved family members right there. Overcome with grief. There is no way you can produce a good portrait if you become emotional or allow yourself to be swept up in the emotions of the other people in the house. Kaim responds with a silent nod. His only connection with the woman is to have boarded the same boat and sat at the same table in the cafe on deck. Only a few minutes have passed since she started volunteering her stories, but that is all it has taken for Kaim to perceive the hint of nihilism. Nihilism? Yeah, nihilism. Sorry, not nihilism. Nihilism lurking in her beautiful features. The more respectable artists despise painters like me. Why is that? Well, half of them accuse us of making a living from people's deaths. The other half look down on us for not being moved by what we do. I see their point. I mean, the emotions are what give rise to all the arts. Whether it is painting, sculpture, music, or literature, we don't have emotions like that. We're nothing but craftsmen. Rosa speaks without a hint of either self-mockery or pride. Her tone suggests that she is merely stating the obvious in an obvious way. Kaim takes up the sip of his rye whiskey, and Rosa drinks from her rose petal tea. The boat makes, it le makes its leisurely way downstream. The season is spring. The river is high with snowmelt, and white water birds have settled on its surface. Strange, Rosa says with a giggle. <laughs> when I first saw you, I thought you and I must be members of the same profession, which is why I took the initiative to speak to you. Kaim gives her a strained smile. He knows nothing about painting it, and he is surely certain that there is nothing about his appearance that would cause him to be mistaken for an artist. It could be, however, that in the profile of this man drinking whiskey alone in the afternoon, Rosa has recognized the hue, the hue of nihilism like her own. Or then again, she might have perceived the shadow of the other side, clinging fast to Kaim's back. Until a few days ago, Kaim was on the battlefield. There, he witnessed the killing of many enemies and many allies. But he was unmoved by any of it. Such youthfulness had long since vanished from him. Though outwardly unchanged, Kaim has lived through several centuries. Rosa says that she is in her mid thirties, and in her tenth year since becoming a portraitist of the dead, which apparently puts her near the beginning of her career. If you wouldn't mind, she adds, I have a few more things I'd like to discuss with you. When Kaim nods silently in compliance, Rosa thanks him and gives him her first heartfelt smile of the day. Portraitists of the dead are never present while the subject is dying. The very fact that such a professional has been called means the person's death is imminent, and so theirs is, a scene as a, is seen as a presence of ill omen and even defilement. A family member or friend who has been at the bedside dares to broach the subject quietly in another room. Do you think it may be time to call the painter? The answer, whether too soon for that or I think you may be right, is delivered in guarded tones. Introduced to the family by the church, the portraitist never enters the house by the front door. Rather, he or she goes around to the back and is shown to a room where the sun cannot penetrate. There, the painter changes into mourning clothes and waits for the announcement of the death. Eventually, a quiet dark knock on the door is followed by a summons to appear, and the painter, dressed in mourning, sets to work. Not all deaths occur at the end of long lifetimes, of course. All too often, the painter must depict the face of one who has died young of illness or accident. The face that emerges in the artist's sketchbook radiates the delicate vivacity of one who has just crossed the border, dividing life from death. One who has only moments before transited, transited, transited from this world to the other world. The work presented to the family is an oil painting done from the sketch, but Rosa believes the sketch itself is a far more authentic portrait of the dead. There is nothing quite like the atmosphere in a room where someone has just died. How to put it? It is as though the flow of time has stopped 
where time itself has melted into the very air. The sobbing and the wailing sound as if they might last forever. The only movement of time in all this being the way the face of de the dead person emerges little by little onto the blank white page of the sketchbook. She hands him her thick sketch pad. See, she says, showing him countless faces of the dead. This is two years worth. Many of the faces are peaceful, but others are full of agony, and all without expression possess a mysterious presence. They differ unmistakably from faces in sleep. Neither, however, do they look dead. They seem as if they might open their eyes at any moment, or just as easily crumble to ash. They hover, men and women alike, on the very brink of death. After the body has cooled, it's too late. It's also too late if the family has begun making its preparations for the funeral. The game is won or lost in those very few minutes following death itself. All we can do is start sketching as efficiently and expeditiously as possible. With a painful smile, Rosa adds, In the eyes of the family, though, that makes me a cold-hearted woman. Kyan turns the pages of her sketchbook, saying nothing. He would like to tell her that it is the same on the battlefield. There is no one there. No one has time to mourn the death of a soldier. If you're busy shedding tears instead of doing your next thing you have to do, you end up being one of those forced to travel to the other world. The final sketch in the book is unfinished. The face of a young girl. The general outlines of the hair and face are sketched in. Nothing more. Kaim looks questioningly at Rosa. My daughter she says softly. But why? A portrait painter of the dead reaches full maturity in the profession when she is able to paint a member of her own family, which only makes sense. I mean, how self-serving is it when you can be coldly objective towards the death of a stranger, but not toward a member of your own family? Her daughter, her daughter died two years ago. The girl's three short years of life brought to a sudden end by a bad flu that was making the rounds. I was holding her hand until the moment she died, Rosa says. I was in tears, calling her name and pleading with her to come back to me, not to die. After the daughter looked at her with a shake of his drooping head, though, Rosa released her daughter's hands and opened the sketchbook. Wiping her tears, she picked up her pencil and tried to sketch her daughter's face. But I couldn't do it. The tears came pouring out of me no matter how much I wiped them. I simply couldn't work. Kaim turns his gaze on the unfinished sketch again. Some areas of the white paper were wavy, perhaps where Rose's tears had fallen. I guess I am not qualified to be a portraitist of the dead. She says with a smile, glancing down at the river. But still, if I had to choose one work of art to leave behind, this would be it. The boat gives a blast of steam horn. Frightened, bir frightened, the birds in the river leap into the air in great mass. Kyan closes the sketchbook and returns it to Rosa. He considers complimenting her on the excellence of the drawing, but chooses silence instead. Such praise, he feels, could be a sign of disrespect for her work, for Rosa herself, and for her dead daughter. I didn't mean to bend your ear like this, she says. I am sorry. She stands and peers at Kaim once again. Really, though, you look like a member of my profession. Kaim gives her a strange smile and shakes his head. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. She responds with a strange smile of her own. And you probably won't like my saying this either. But please call me if you ever need a portraitist of the dead. I won't need one, Ham says. I have no family. No family? Well then, when your own time comes. With a little chuckle, Rosa leaves. Her right hand grasps the case with her painting supplies. Her left the garment bag with morning clothes. Unfortunately, Kaim will never need her services. 
He will not, cannot, go to the other world just yet. On the long, long road of his life, how many deaths must he encounter? The steam horn blasts again, the boat gradually lowers its speed and edges toward the riverbank. The landing draws closer, and he leaves the boat. His journey will begin again. It will be a long journey. The next battlefield lies far beyond the mountains that tower in the distance. End. Okay. So, this of course, the bridge. Another thing is I found someone who wanted the crystal fragments. Um, this is one of the houses back there. And I believe they need 13 more, so I have not yet gathered enough. I don't know why I wanted to grab that, but I would have assumed I had already done it. Alright. Have I been in here? I don't recall. Oh yes I have. And that's okay. And yes, Kaim has mid-met ears. And just so that you're aware of their progress, the mid-met ear occasionally decreases the damage inflicted by magic to zero. This is something that I thought was really neat because if the front line, which is in charge of defending the back line, doesn't take damage, then the GC doesn't reduce. And if the GC does not reduce, then the back line will continue to be protected more. In essence, it will help Kyle fulfill. His job is Defender. So we head back to the Crimson Forest. Still love this travel music. Here we go. While I will continue to level up with two dreams under our belt, I think that is a great place for this to end. If you haven't already, then we'd love to hear any comments you have. I'm Ludinowski. As always, have fun. <laughs>